Hi, I'm Professor Heidi Newberg, and I'm going to tell you about a milestone that we've reached on Milky Way at home. Uh, there was a dwarf galaxy that fell into the Milky Way billions of years ago, several billion years ago, and the tidal forces from the Milky Way ripped it apart, pulled the stars off of it. They got spread out in the sky into this big stream, and we were, have been able to reconstruct from that stream what the dwarf galaxy that fell into the Milky Way three billion years ago looked like. And this is part of a longer term goal that we have of trying to figure out where dark matter is in the Milky Way galaxy. And in this short video, I will explain to you everything I just said uh, so that you can understand uh, what we have accomplished. This video shows a dwarf galaxy, in this case, the Sagittarius dwarf galaxy that is in orbit around the Milky Way, which is represented as that blue disk that you're seeing on edge that's at the center. And as the dwarf galaxy goes around, the Milky Way uh, pulls harder on the part that's closer and, and less hard on the part that's away. And so it stretches the dwarf galaxy and pulls the stars off. And when the stars are pulled off of the dwarf galaxy, then they start orbiting the Milky Way. And some get pulled ahead and some get pulled behind. And you get this big stream of stars, which can circle all the way around the Milky Way galaxy. This is a picture of what would look like. This is actual data looking up at the sky. It's colored based on distances to the stars. Um, but you can see that there's this higher density region right here that is the stream from that Sagittarius dwarf galaxy in the simulation that I just showed you. And this is also part of this is all part of the Sagittarius dwarf galaxy. But there was another stream, the Orphan stream, that was also visible in this picture. And that orphan stream was called the orphan stream because we've never been able to find a dwarf galaxy that that has made it. And so we think that dwarf galaxy is completely disrupted and doesn't exist anymore. Thus, the name orphan stream. But another group uh, in 2018 looked at data in another part of the sky. Our data was in the north and this data was in the south and found the Chenob stream which is very faint here. You can see in the picture on the right where the Chenob stream goes. And they didn't know at the time that they named that stream that it actually is the same stream of stars coming from the same dwarf galaxy as the Orphan stream in the north. And so because it was named two different things and it's got both names in the literature, uh, we now call it the Orphan Chenob stream or OCS. My graduate student, Eric Mendelston, has created a simulation for you that will show you how it is that we can determine what the dwarf galaxy looked like before it became this tidal stream. So you have a dwarf galaxy and we run a simulation of it going all around the Milky Way. And then at the end of the simulation, we compare it with the data. In this case, the data is red. And so that simulation was too wide. So we try one that's smaller and up, oh, that one is too narrow. And so maybe we'll try a dwarf galaxy somewhere in between. And if we do this enough times, we can find something that matches really well. And so we keep doing this. If it takes 10,000 times, it takes 50,000 times, it takes 100,000 times to guess what the dwarf galaxy looks like, we'll do it until we get a perfect fit to the data. But doing that many simulations and trying that many guesses for what a dwarf galaxy looks like takes a lot of computing power. Um, and luckily, we have about 20,000 people at any given time all over the world who are donating their computer cycles, the ones that they're not using, to our uh, computations. And that is what Milky Way at Home is. We have a server that's at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, and we send out over the internet a work unit which is, says, this is a bunch of parameters I'd like you to try. And these people all over the world will crunch through the numbers and tell us how good a fit it is to the data that we're trying to fit. And then we keep sending out more work units until we get a really, really, really good fit to our data. And so how do we make the data? Um, this is a description of what is in a, a new paper, uh, Mendelssohn, Eric Mendelssohn et al., uh, called Estimate of the Mass and Radial Profile of the Orphan Chenob Stream's Dwarf Galaxy Progenitor Using Milky Way at Home, uh, which is now being published in the Astrophysical Journal. Um, and you can see in this picture that we've taken a piece on the sky, this red and the blue, 
traces the path of the orphan Chenop stream in the sky. And this is the part of the sky we have data for. And then we also look at a piece of the sky that's on one side and a piece of the sky that's on the other side. And that's the off stream. That's our comparison field where we don't have a stream. And I show in the right hand plot the number of stars that we find as a function of position along that stream in red. And then the number of stars that we find in the off field in green. Now, these are all stars that we think are at the right distance to be in the stream, but some of them are where the stream is and some of them where the stream isn't. And if you take the difference between them, then you see how many excess stars are in the stream. And so this is the actual density of stream stars that we will give to Milky Way at home that it has to match. Um, we've also found that in addition to having the density along the stream, we need to know the density across the stream. And so we divide the stream up into nine pieces, and then we plot the density of stars across the stream in, in that direction, and we'll fit the background plus a Gaussian, which is the fit to the stream. And the width of that Gaussian is what we give to Milky Way at home for the width. And we have nine places where we have measured the width of the stream. And so then we'll try, we'll send it to Milky Way at home. It'll try tens of thousands of dwarf galaxy shapes and it'll tell us what's the best shape that matches the data that we see in the sky. And here is the result. We have uh, plotted in galactic coordinates, the X, Y, and Z, um, but it doesn't matter what the coordinates are. The red shows you where stars from that dwarf galaxy are spread out. And the purple shows you where dark matter from the, the dwarf galaxy has has been spread out. Now we're only able to compare with stars because we can't see the dark matter in the tidal stream, but the, the dwarf galaxy has both and the simulation can tell us exactly where the dark matter is. And so this gives us an idea that the, the stars are in a fairly tight stream across the sky, but the dark matter is a much wider stream that goes much further out. And that's because the stars start out closer to the center. Of, of this dwarf galaxy. Um, and our result says that it's been 3.6 billion years uh, that this dwarf galaxy has been orbiting the Milky Way and disrupting. And the mass of the, of the star part, that's the red part of this diagram, is about three times 10 to the fifth or 300,000 times the mass of the sun. Um, the scale radius of how, how the stars were dis distributed in the original dwarf galaxy is about 200 parsecs, and the distribution of the, the dark matter initially was almost four times as much. So the dark matter is a larger uh, uh, distribution with a, a smaller uh, stellar distribution inside it. And those are all numbers that are pretty close to what we would have expected for a dwarf galaxy, an ultra-faint dwarf galaxy falling into our galaxy. The surprise for us was that the dark matter was less than we expected. The dark matter is about uh, two times 10 to the seventh or about 20 million times as much mass as our sun has. And uh, the dwarf galaxies that we see in the Milky Way today, even the ultra faint dwarf galaxies have masses that are substantially higher than that that have been measured. So here is uh, a visualization of that. This is a plot from a nature paper by Strigari et al. 2008, and it shows you uh, the mass within 300 parsecs. You take a piece in the middle of each dwarf galaxy that is measured in the, in the Milky Way galaxy, um, and it's a function of the luminosity of that galaxy. So the classical dwarf galaxies we've known about for a long time are these bright ones up here, and the more recent ultra-faint dwarf galaxies are down here on the fainter end. Um, and they're all about the same mass within this uh, fixed volume. But the orphan, orphan Chenob progenitor is down here at this green X, and this is a log scale on the Y axis. So that's a factor of 10 less in mass than was expected from observations of our current dwarf galaxies. And so that might make you ask, does that mean that dwarf galaxies have masses that are smaller than we thought? Um, does it mean the mass measurements of ultra faint galaxies that exist today are wrong? And if they are wrong, that's a problem because uh, particle physicists are using that dark matter mass to set constraints on dark matter from their indirect detection experiments, which target dwarf galaxies because they have so much dark matter in them. 
Um, or is it that dwarf galaxies that are not disrupted today are just fundamentally different from a dwarf galaxy that fell in and got disrupted three billion years ago? Um, but we're soft peddling this a little bit because this is the first time we've ever used this technique to determine the mass and radio profile of a dwarf galaxy progenitor. And there are a few things that we need to check uh, to make sure that there's, there, there are no systematics that could affect this result. Um, one of the main systematics that we're trying to, to check is this large, the effect of the Large Magellanic Cloud if you see here is the orphan Cheneb stream stars, and then the blue is a simulation of the orphan stream being made. And the Large Magellanic Cloud is a not very dwarf galaxy, dwarf galaxy that is coming in close to the Milky Way. And as you can see, the blue um, simulation has been dragged away from the black dotted line, which is the orbit of the large of the um, progenitor of the orphan Cheneb stream and has been pulled away by the gravity of the Large Magellanic Cloud. And we didn't include the gravity of the Large Magellanic Cloud when we did our calculations. Now we think that that probably isn't, we're hoping that's not a problem because we mostly used the data from the stars that are in the northern part of the sky up here, which are not much affected by the Large Magellanic Cloud, which is coming on the south side of, of the Milky Way right now. But that is something that we need to check. And there are other things. There are always many things that can cause that can bring a, a measurement off of what you think you've been able to determine. In the long term, it's my hope that we will be running Milky Way on a whole bunch of dwarf galaxies at the same time. And uh, we will not be fitting just the properties of the dwarf galaxies that fell in, but we'll also be fitting simultaneously the orbits that they fell in on, the times that they have fallen in, and the properties of the Milky Way galaxy itself. And there's some evidence that we, sh we will be able to fit all of these different things at the same time with a sufficient software development. And if we're able to do that and we're able to determine the, the gravity of the Milky Way galaxy at all positions in the galaxy, because we've looked at streams in all different places, uh, then we can determine from that where the dark matter is, because dark matter is thought to be 85% of all the mass in the Milky Way. And so if you figure out where the things are that are causing the gravity, you're pretty much figuring out where the dark matter is. And um, that knowledge will help us to maybe understand what dark matter is, because uh, certain properties of dark matter, how it interacts with matter, how it interacts with itself, will determine how it gets distributed in a Milky Way-like galaxy. And so that will give us a chance to study dark matter in the only way we've actually been successful in studying dark matter, which is by looking at how it affects the things we can see, like stars. So to recap, uh, for the first time, we've measured dark matter in the progenitor of a stream of stars that is currently uh, spread across the whole Milky Way galaxy. This is a big step towards determining where dark matter is located in the Milky Way, and we're using an all-volunteer supercomputer, and thank you so much to our volunteers for making all of this possible.